We, uh, we heard a lot of rhetoric today uh, from the governor uh, about how the Indiana General Assembly and some of the decisions we make have impacted Hoosiers across the state. What we didn't hear is the, the fact that for the last two decades we've come to a, a time in our state's history where we don't adequately support K-12 public funding. We are unhealthy. We don't have the educated workforce to, to attract some of the businesses that we uh, hopefully because we're the best place to do business from a tax environment standpoint, uh, that we're actually not going to be successful. So what our caucus has been focused on is something that finally uh, the governor has decided that this is uh, something that they want to do. Uh, it's real simple. We want to change lives for Hoosiers. And you can do that in combination with making sure that businesses are successful. We want to talk about providing relief to Hoosiers from starting with the high cost, the tax that the governor used today on parents for sending their kids to public school that's supposed to be free. It is supposed to be a tuition free education. Yet we allow some fees, technology and otherwise, to end up costing parents and costing children in the end. So we want to eliminate those. When we see that our economy is so good that we still have people who can't afford housing and who can't afford childcare costs. We have childcare deserts across the state where people can't even have access to childcare, yet we still want to continue to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into bringing businesses here. We're saying from the Democrat policy standpoint, it's time to take a look at households and not just businesses. So with that, um, I'm willing, and Senator Yoder is here with me today, and we're willing to take any questions that you have. Based on the responses that you were hearing tonight, how tough a sell do you think uh, are going to be, A, the textbook the fee repeal, and B, the 1.157 for K-12? Let's talk about the textbook fee. You, you, I stood up. I, I didn't look behind me, but I think everyone in the chamber stood up. Uh, we need to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, the young lady who came... Who, had to pay $630 book rental fee for a book that she has a turn. It kind of reminds me of when we used to go to college and they tell us the book was $100 and then you try to go sell it back and they say they're going to give you five. And then you go back the next year, you find somebody on campus who has that same book that you had because you saw the notes and they just paid 95. Kind of reminds me of that little program. Parents deserve better. And if the state of Indiana, if Hoosiers are going to support the state of Indiana to the point where we can have two and a half billion dollars in reserves, then we can at least provide relief for them so they don't have to pay textbooks and technology fees. The $1.175 billion, I, I want to give you uh, my view on that. It's about time. If you look, go back to 2012 and you look at our school funding for public schools, you will see a dip from 2012 to 2015, and then you will see an incremental increase to now. And while we stand here and continue to say it's important because we spend over 50% of our budget on K-12 education, why can't it be 60%? Education is, makes the difference in everybody's life. And at some time, we're going to have to recognize that our traditional public schools are failing our kids. The lack of teacher pay increases that we've seen. Listen, we started, the governor brought up 40, we are just now getting teachers to be paid $40,000 a year to start. That, that, that's sad. 
and the average being 60,000, maybe we should be, maybe we should, you know, understand what the average means. That means there's just as many teachers below that number as there are above. That's nothing to write home about. They should be paid more. We should demand that they get paid more. And that $1.175 billion should be required to send and spend money and give teacher raises. That's the way I feel about it. Democrats have long supported more health spending. And yes. The governor certainly asking for an unprecedented infusion into the public health system. Yeah. The Republican leaders just talked about how they want to make sure that there are metrics for success that come along with that money. Are you concerned at all, not about the level of spending, but about how those dollars are going to be spent? Well, we should definitely be looking at how Indiana is at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to public health outcomes. When we hear from the governor that we have a triple A rating when it comes to bonds, I couldn't help but think as I sat there, how and what does that mean for the mom of a child who is sick, an infant born prematurely, who cannot access or afford the health care that's necessary. I couldn't help think about the parent whose son died prematurely because of suicide. I couldn't help but think about a triple A rating and what that means to, to the, the, the parent who wants desperately to help their child achieve more than what they did and have them have a better shot at life whether that's accessing uh, a career in the trades or a four-year education at one of our outstanding universities. We talked a lot about what that means, and I'm not sure it really means so much to Hoosiers when it comes to that AAA rating. When Hoosiers are trying to put food on the table, pay their bills, find affordable house, uh, housing, and afford childcare. It's been that difficult for Hoosiers. So that is a real struggle, and I know that our county health officials are struggling throughout Indiana on how to respond to some of these abysmal public health outcomes. So that's where my thought process w was when, as I was listening to some of the gov uh, governor's comments and I expect many Hoosiers were thinking the same. What do you do for connection between brain drain and Indiana's recent culture war related bills, such as abortion and the trans athletes? I think we'll absolutely see this. Right now, we're waiting to hear how the courts will decide uh, with SB1. I was struck by one of the Quotes. I wrote it down uh, in the governor's speech, uh, and I think it was something along the lines of, we've controlled the rate at which we've, the size of government. And I thought, we in this legislature have controlled more than that. And whether we're talking about young people wanting to stay in Indiana, and call Indiana home, how businesses will attract talent to Indiana if SB1 stands, and the current health care short provider shortages that we already have throughout Indiana. SB1 is certainly not a welcome mat there. The ambiguity that SB1 put forth for so many health providers in this state will only drive down those outcomes even more. In your minds, what was the most glaring omission from the government's <laughs> Well, the one thing that I just still have not understood was the discussion of cannabis in the state of Indiana. Uh, you know, the governor, I don't know if he got caught on a hot mic or somebody caught him in the right mood, said that we would look at decriminalization. He would, doesn't think somebody should pay the ultimate price 
for indiscretion as a child or when they were young. It's, it's a real simple solution to that. You could either legalize it or decriminalize a certain amount. And I hope, I really hope, that they are having those discussions because uh, one of the things that you'll see in the governor's budget proposal is an $800 million investment into a prison. The, I mean, it, to me, it's the simple putting your money where your mouth is. They're requesting $800 million for renovations to a prison. And guess what? If we were to legalize some form of marijuana or can, cannabis legislation, we could pay for it and probably release so many people who are behind bars for a simple possession. But uh, that was what I thought was glaring. I think the people of the state of Indiana have overwhelming, just like 85% of, of Hoosiers believe that we should have some form of legal cannabis in the state of Indiana, and it would be a revenue generator to uh, the state. I think I spoke to it a moment ago of where I thought there was a real gap in truly addressing the brain drain uh, and what is to come. We're going to see how SB1 uh, stands in the courts, but without true addressing uh, the health care issue and access affordability in the state of Indiana, uh, we are doing a disservice to Hoosiers across the state. That's a good question. I, I think I said this two years ago. Some of you who were here might have heard me say this. I find myself in a, in a very interesting situation supporting a lot of the projects that the governor wants to do while his, his own political party colleagues are questioning whether or not we should do certain things. Listen, textbook fees, uh, 21st century scholar automatic enrollment, uh, the decriminalization of small amounts of, of uh, cannabis. I think if you were to poll 80% of Hoosiers, we'd be uh, all on board with that. But again, and we've seen this just recently in Washington, D.C., when you have so much power and then you got a little fraction of people who want to control that power, you can't get anything done. And what I find, I think the governor's got a long way to go. Uh, and as I've said, I, I find myself in the same position I was in uh, 2020. I support a lot of the things that are in his budget. Not everything, but uh, we'll see how it goes. But I think he's got a long way to go to get uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to support it. I do uh, teach uh, young people at, uh, in my district, and while salaries are definitely important, I mean, you have to pay your bills, you also want to be able to live somewhere where you feel like you're fully valued, that your dignity is there. And what we saw this past summer in that special session I believe, put a real question mark for many Hoosiers on whether or not that's true. And so as young people decide where they want to call home, where they want to start their families, I think this is a real disconnect for many Hoosiers on how we're, and how are we going to bridge that gap when it comes to that brain drain. You know, I, I was reading uh, some literature in Forbes magazine that the governor actually quoted. And 
the, gen the generation that we're talking about attracting to the state of Indiana for these jobs, they don't even, they look at lifestyle differences first before they even look at wages. There are many people who are choosing lifestyle over dollars. That means hybrid work schedules, living in communities where they feel free to be who they are, what they, what they have, the freedoms that they have. And quite frankly, it's right up there with wages. I mean, the cost to live the way I did when I was younger is almost 40% higher. And the next generation of, of workers or, or people are not looking at that as a necessity. They will take the lower wage job to stay in communities where their activities and their lifestyles are accepted. And, and, I, and I challenge you to go to the business community and ask them that question. Those 70 and $50 an hour jobs, forget that. Let's just go to the IDC. Look at their own data. The jobs that come to the state of Indiana that get filled are $25 an hour and less. Their own data even shows that after you hit the $27, $28 mark, those jobs, 60% of them are not filled. So how can we think that wages, increase in the wages is going to going to actually, it, it will, it will incentivize people. Yes. It, you have to pay your bills, but lifestyle is, is definitely at the top of the list from what I understand. And I think that's what we've seen actually. 